All right, so welcome to episode 18 of the Honest Truth Podcast. We are here with Ryan Short, co-founder yeah. sure. of Cotton yeah. Architecture. Yeah, great. Welcome. I'm excited. Awesome. I did good, right? Yeah, that was perfect. All right. So, Cotton Architecture, tell us a little bit about how that began. Yeah, so we we are a three-year-old architecture firm, three-and-a-half-year-old architecture firm here out of Phoenix. I mean, you guys kind of know a lot of our, our history because you've been kind of pretty integral to it. Um, you know, my partner, Steve Goodman, and I, we started it um, three-and-a-half years ago. We kind of just decided to to make the jump and, and really kind of jump ship with f- wanting to focus on healthcare. Uh, at the time, and, and you know, since then we've we've really kind of grown. Um, we're up to six people, um, including Steve and I right now. Um, and honestly, it feels like we could be at seven or eight here in the next probably month or two. We're just kind of waiting to see how a couple couple things land here. Um, but yeah, really, since day one, it's it's been healthcare focused, and and just the way things are in the valley. You know, we do a fair amount of industrial now, which is huge. I think just about any architecture firm here in the valley is is touching that kind of stuff. So. Um, you know, we, we like to, to kind of work with people we like to work with. We like working with you guys. We like working with owners we like to work with. Um, and that was really probably the biggest impetus for Steve and I jumping is, is just that kind of self-control almost of, of getting to work with who you want to work with and, and kind of building your relationships that way. So that's the quick, the quick, I don't know how much you want me to go in, but no, I I think it's perfect. So, so, um, you kind of hit my question as I was in the middle of, of thinking about asking it, but you know, that, that's why you guys jumped, right? You mm-hmm. wanted to focus on who you're going to work with, why you're going to work with them and, and what you're going to work on. Mm-hmm. But, but what has kind of been the, uh, or what was the initial risk that you guys identified when you were like, all right, Hey, are we going to do this? Yeah. Yeah. It, it kind of goes back. I think, um, Steve and I used to work at a firm here in the Valley called Devaney Group. We both Still, I mean, they're an awesome firm, you know, whole lot of respect for them. And we worked together at the time. And back then, Steve and I were joking, or I think it was at one of those uh, open bar Christmas parties. Steve Steve came over to me. He's like, we should start a firm. And I was like, man, I, I can't. I've got, you know, I, I think I probably just bought a condo at that point. And, and, you know, I was settled into my job, was paying off student loans and all that stuff. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that, man. I can't do that. And then uh, uh, probably eight, eight, nine months later, you know, we, we ended up kind of jumping ship to a different firm here in the Valley for kind of a short stint. And, and then, you know, after about three or four months there, I kind of called Steve, Steve's bluff and I was like, let's, let's do it. Let's start a farm. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I've got four kids. I can't, you know, I can't do that. Um, so there was, was a lot of risk. Yeah. Yeah. He's <laughs> like, he's like, you were supposed <laughs> to remember that. Heart, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there was a lot of risk. I think, you know, obviously Steve kudos to him. He, he jumped with a lot of risk. I mean, a lot of kids or I shouldn't say a lot of kids. He's got a lot of, he's got a few kids. Yeah. Um, Handful. more, uh, more than I do, um, more than a zero. Children, yeah. yeah. So I, I think, I mean, there's always the risk of failure. I think, um, I think at that, that moment it was, you kind of, you just got to make the jump. I don't know. I think risk wise, you kind of just have to trust yourself. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know how else to describe it. You kind of have that self-confidence of, I don't know what the heck we're going to do or how we're going to do it, but I suppose we'll we'll have to figure it out. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think people don't understand that the healthcare market really lends itself towards entrepreneurs, and mm-hmm. and I'm sure you guys have seen this. I, I'm going to ask you to elaborate a little bit, but the majority of the doctors that we deal with mm-hmm. are entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. and and so I think there's a quick identification mm-hmm. on. All right, so you guys own your firm. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we respect you guys taking that jump. Um, one of the things that Vans identified with a lot of the clients and the doctors that we work with is their entrepreneurial spirit, right? Mm-hmm. So are you seeing that with the docs that you're working with? A- absolutely. I mean, we, we we don't work with a lot of the big name vendors. We, we do work with them, but they're not our biggest kind of healthcare, you know, focus really by any means. Um, it's really those small scale doctors. I, I think, you know, if you don't work for the banners or the dignities or you know, the other big names in town, you are an entrepreneurial doctor. There's not small health systems. There can't, just by definition, they almost can't be. Um, so, yeah, you see a lot of these, um, you know, small cluster of doctors or maybe even one or two doctors that own their own clinics and things like that. And, and that is really kind of our focus in what we do. It's a lot of imaging centers and a lot mm-hmm. of ASCs that, that they, um, I believe, with recent federal health care guideline changes, they're able to have greater ownership and stuff like that. So that's a huge incentive for them to, to go out and 
and uh, and kind of start their own thing. But yeah, yeah. We, we see it all the time. There, there's tricky tricky stuff with them though. I think they they are doctors first, probably developers and building owners second. So there's a lot yeah. of learning and teaching that that I mean that's kind of what you guys are helpful helpful does, with early on. So. How does the time work out with that? Like they're a doctor, obviously they're probably in surgery from yeah. 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. Yeah. And then they have stuff to do after that. What are meetings like with doctors when they're going through the exploratory phase of, hey, I have a building. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. How do I make this into a surgery center? They come talk to you. Are you talking to them at like 10 at night? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe not quite 10, but it's, it's hey, what, what's your availability after 6 or before 7 kind of thing? Or, mm -hmm. or maybe it's over lunch and they're in a break room eating, you know, pizza in their scrubs or something like that and you're trying to get their ear as much as you can to talk to them yeah um they're tricky i mean i mean doctors are just just busy they've got a lot on their mind they're, they're entrepreneurs they've got you know a business to run on top of you know the actual important work that they're doing every day it's yeah i mean they're right. just so time limited um why cotton well, why, why the name cotton so i think got to give kudos to to steve again on that i think um Kind of the the short story of it is we made the decision, short you know, like story. I yeah the yeah. short here's the short story. We want long stories. Here's the cotton the cotton story. Ryan Short. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. He's got it. Um, yeah, I, Steve. Uh, Steve is kind of a word guy. I think my understanding is his thesis in college and stuff was all about words and semantics and stuff like that. So he, when we kind of made the decision to jump, we really had probably two weeks, maybe three or four at best to go from yep we're doing this too we are doing this. Um, you know, we had a month to plan and come up with everything. So, you know, we kicked around ideas. We had a Google Doc spreadsheet of all these kind of random names, just things that jumped into our head. And, and we both knew that we didn't want it, you know, s and R architects or, you know, it's always three letters. I've always worked for firms that were three letters. And it's like, we don't want that. We don't, I don't need my name. I don't really care about my name on something like that. I'd rather kind of build something that's a little bit more open. Um, so Steve, you know, went down this rabbit hole of looking at words and things like that. And he came across, um, you, know, you know, we always tell people we're, we're a relationship focused firm. We want to build rapport with people. Um, and, and kind of as he was going down that rabbit hole, he came across a little known synonym of the word rapport, which is to cotton. To cotton on with someone means mm -hmm. to build rapport, to build a relationship mm -hmm. with. And, and, you know, he latched onto that. And, and now some, some post-rationalization. You know, obviously, it's one of the five C's of Arizona, completely by chance. That's not why we named it that. And then also one of our first projects, of yeah. course, was built in a cotton field. And I have right. a picture from before cotton stand started of me holding cotton in that field is kind of a, you know, kind of came full circle just Pretty by cool. chance. Interesting. And yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. So it, it and, and it's, you know, for that reason, you asked, where did it come from? Everyone does that. You know, it's, it's not, you know, it's kind of like Amazon, you know, yeah. what is that? You know, yeah. Leads to a conversation, and you tell people a little bit about what you're doing. And I, I love it. I think it's super unique. Yeah. And I, you know, uh, side note, I knew the story, but I, but mm -hmm. I, I really, really love like how that kind of came to be, mm -hmm. and then how, after kind of finding the synonym in the words, you guys like found actuality mm -hmm. in, in the in the task. And I, I thought that was cool and and super unique. I, I love it. I think well, it's I mean, you guys are you're that Venn, you're that Venn diagram, right? It's kind of where that came from. The the owner and the what is it? The owner and the developers. Or you guys yeah, are kind of that that center relationship. Like everybody and, like everybody yeah. works together, right? So yeah. like like the the synonyms around yep. around it, I think are cool. Uh, people to this day call me Nick Venn. Like 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 people get my name wrong all mm -hmm. the time because they just assume that every contractor, every architect, every whatever has their name as yeah. part of the part of the entity. Yeah. I didn't want to do that either, yeah. and, and I, I felt the same way, you know, that you guys did. It's like it's not about me; it's, yeah. it's about the team and and the and the the brand that we want to build. And so yeah. I think I think that gives more opportunity to brand building, specifically yeah. for a younger, um, you know, aggressive entrepreneurial firm. Mm -hmm. I think there's more opportunity in brand building when it's not based on one person; it's yeah. based on an entity and an idea, and that's really what we're trying to create. So yeah, yeah I I super and, appreciate and that. When I retire and Steve's still working, you know, what's he gonna do with Short Goodman Architects. I mean, right. it's just a, yeah, yeah. yeah, when I'm out. And yeah, point. or he yeah. retires. Yeah. I mean, no, 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 I, I, no, you no, know, no. Or, or, or they retire yeah. or, yeah, no, yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah, or, it, if, or if one of the eight kids doesn't want to take it over, like, yeah. what are you going to do, right? Yeah, 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 and it leaves it open. <laughs> you know, we didn't want to be, you know, our, our I guess our legal name is Cotton Architecture and Design, but we also wanted cotton to be somewhat flexible you like ven marketing or ven mm -hmm. i forget the the kind of facility compliance. management compliance ven compliance that you guys are doing not a sponsor I'm not, a not sponsor. yet <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah we wanted it to be flexible i mean we've got you know all kinds of ideas we wanted to be flexible do we want to do furniture design i don't know right. do we want to do development i think we 
you know, Sell as a team, kind of want to. We can yeah. do we can do cotton cotton t-shirts. Cotton t-shirts. Yeah. Cotton but they're all going to be polyester. Seventy <laughs> percent. Yeah, seventy percent. <laughs> majority well, owner. Yeah. Majority owner polyester. <laughs> yeah. Sign. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. Um, so Ryan, one of the things that that I use you guys for, aside from phenomenal architecture, mm-hmm. is just as a resource. Mm-hmm. So so how is your um, ability to be contacted and, and, and used as a resource benefited cotton in its, um, I, I don't want to say in its start, because you guys are well beyond the start, but, but how has your ability to be a, a open resource benefited cotton in its, in its mm-hmm. journey so far? I think, um, I think it's one of the things that, that people appreciate the most about us is the accessibility, not only of Steve and I, um, but of, of the entire team. Um, you know, I think uh, we're, I'd still say a startup, but we're not in our first six months. We are somewhat established, I'd say, after three and a half, almost four years. Um, you know, we don't have that legacy history of cotton. We, Steve and I both have, you know, Steve's got 15, 20 years. I've got 10, 12 years of experience, something like that. So we've got history, but cotton doesn't have that to lean back on. So clients and stuff like that are sometimes hesitant to do that. So, you know, without that, I think what we do try to push is, push is our responsiveness. And I think not only to contractors for issues that might come up in the field, but, but to clients, um, you know, they're, they're not afraid to call anyone on the team. And, and the way Steve and I kind of want things is, is we don't want you to feel like you can only call mm-hmm. Steve and I, um, you know, we want you to have your point of contact and they're the one that knows the most about the job. You know, Steve and I know a lot about a lot of projects, but there's, there's, people on the team who just know more about it. It's just yeah. a fact of how, how projects are. That project architect or job captain, whatever you want to call it, just just knows more. So they should be the one that, that feels that answer. And and we're in an open office. So, you know, if there's an issue, you know, everyone hears the same phone calls and, mm-hmm. and we can all collaborate and I can roll over to to someone else and, and help them through something if, if there's a bigger issue that's above, above their head or whatever. But um, just being accessible is probably the number one feedback we get from from clients for sure they say we're responsive we're quick you know that kind of stuff is is what we try to push since we're building yeah. that legacy as we speak kind of yeah thing. so so you spurred like three questions for me because because you you guys were in a like a co-working space mm-hmm. and now you moved to your own space mm-hmm. and 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 kind of have that uniqueness as you've grown but but you left the open office concept mm. right that's that's not super usual. I mean, you you guys are are like open. Well, mm. like, like you made oh, a yeah. comment, like somebody's on the phone, like you're hearing their phone call, right? Oh like, yeah. Like so so, how has that been a benefit to your team? They, uh, uh, I mean, they've just grown tremendously. So the the short story there is is we when we started, you know, Steve and I were doing that that stereotypical thing. We were working out of our, our out of our bedrooms, um, which everyone was at that point. It was mm-hmm. era of COVID, really. Um, and then when we hired Madeline, we hired her. Um, Ah, uh, geez, I don't know. On like a Wednesday or Thursday, we we you know finally agreed on everything, and then by Friday and Saturday, Steve were like, "We we need an office. We we can't." I'm not a person who wants to work remote. I love working with people. Um, it's just who I am. I don't I don't like the Zoom calls nonstop. Um, so we're like, we got to find an office, and and so we found this this co working space over a weekend. I think signed our lease thing, you know, on Saturday or Sunday, and then by Monday or Tuesday, we were working out of there with with Madeline as a small team. Uh, in a probably eight by eight or 10 by 10, you know, office. And so it was great. I mean, we were, like I said, we were, we had a lot of fun phone calls, you know, good, bad, and different. You know, you're always picking up the call and most of the time you're putting it on speaker and, and we're all hearing it, like I said, and Madeline is just absorbing it. Um, and then shortly after we hired Madeline, we hired Chase and it was the four of us in that little tight, tight little office. Um, and then, you know, eight months after that, probably we hired Christy and then we had mm-hmm. to kind of you know, do that crab shell thing where you move to the next shell up in this co-working space. And there was five of us in there and then and Christy's on the interior side. So she started filling it with materials and stuff like that. And we quickly, <laughs> you know, we're busting at the seams in, in that 200 square foot office. And then um, we made the decision, I guess, to hire Holden, um, who's kind of our most recent. We're like, well, we're up against our lease. We can't expand anymore. They didn't have any more room for us. So within about a month, we had to find a bigger shell. And yeah. in that case, it was renting something that was, you know, 10 times the size. We went from 200 square feet to about 2000 and everyone actually has their own space. And I think just the team has just grown in, yeah. into that space. And, and like I said, when, when you walk in the front door, Steve's desk is, is by the door. He's, he's our front desk person, which is kind of funny. <laughs> um, 
and then I'm immediately behind him and then you know everyone else is kind of just in in the room sort of in front of us and we're all open there's there's no walls except for the conference room and the bathroom really and you know, if there's a private conversation or you know some kind of super sensitive thing you can always go into the bathroom I suppose and take a call <laughs> or go into the conference room and shut the door but um, other than that we're open you know so it's, so it's what's been like beneficial about that like yeah. like I, I don't know that that's a, a totally common thing I think mm-hmm. it's becoming more and more mm-hmm. you know more and more uh, embraced mm-hmm. but but what's what's been beneficial about that so you talked about a little bit about the growth of your mm-hmm. employees mm-hmm. but like that's been pretty strategic, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I was kind of alluding to, just having them be the point person. I mean, yeah. they, they they get to hear everything so they know what's going on on every project. They they can be backup on projects. They can they can do all that. But besides kind of the, the programmatic, I guess, um, issues, I think it's just part of the culture. Like yeah. we, we are just a, a – I think we have fun. I mean, like you guys, you guys seem to have fun here all the time, and, and it's and it's open. I mean, 90% of the time we have music playing in the background kind of softly, but, you know, we've got music. We're putting on different playlists, you know, what people like to listen to. I'm yeah. always yelling across the room, you know, hey, you know, Madeline or Christy, what are we doing here on this this thing? And it's just part of the culture, and I think yeah. just having that open discussion. I, I don't want to be in a small office. I don't – don't need to have a principal's office or corner office. I don't. Right. I don't care. I'd rather just be with my team and, and be a right. team together. I, I really don't. I don't I, like being by myself. I think that's so important yeah. too. As, as someone who's young mm-hmm. and still learning, mm-hmm. uh, Nick is by far the the best leader that I have experienced in in the working world. And uh, a big way that I've been able to absorb that is kind of our close working quarters. Nick walks around the halls. Uh, he talks on the phone, the way he talks to us. So in an open working environment mm-hmm. like that, it allows your other employees to understand how mm-hmm. you treat clients, how oh, you yeah. speak, the words that you use, the way that you use them. And I think that builds culture so well, mm-hmm. just having that, that experience of being able to, to look at you and Steve mm-hmm. and how you handle clients and problems and in your day-to-day life and then being able to absorb that as an employee oh, yeah. that's huge yeah yeah because they don't you know if if we were doing this remote firm thing which kind of is a growing trend i think there's a lot of firms that are going to this remote model i honestly don't know how you make that work with with people who are relatively new i, th- I think both chase and madeline had a little bit of experience christy had a lot of experience she's got 10 years or so and holden's pretty green out of out of grad school i don't know how you make that that work and i don't know how you develop people as well um, or as efficiently, I guess, when you're all remote. I think it's exponential learning when you're just together. You know, you yeah. pick up a million little conversations or bits of facts or bits of jobs that if you're sitting in your room, you're not hearing because you're only hearing what's on that Zoom call and you just you just don't well, hear it. And, and it shapes your hiring practices, mm-hmm. right? So so one of the challenges, I think, for, for growing companies or, or newer firms is mm-hmm. like, how are you going to hire, right? Mm-hmm. So So you guys, I mean, it's a little bit, I mean, your employees are all a little bit different, but how mm-hmm. did you guys go about hiring and what was kind of your target? Culture first, people yeah. first. Um, you know, we always look for relevant experience, but I would say that's that's not not even the top factor. I think when we knew we had to hire someone, um, I think we put a job post up on LinkedIn was, was just where we did. We didn't know any different. Um, you know, we knew there were job fairs and stuff like that, but our first step wasn't wasn't to do that, I guess. We went to LinkedIn and and purely by chance Madeline reached out to us and and I can't believe it worked out. It's been just great. And then, you know, it's really just word of mouth from that point. Madeline put us in touch with Chase, who was a classmate. Um, and then uh, Christy was, I think, a referral from a contractor and a, a broker, I think, mm-hmm. both kind of told her, I think, about us. I think is how she kind of reached out to us, but it was kind of word of mouth through through other people. And then um, I think Madeline and Chase went to a job fair at ASU and, and kind of ran into Holden. So we don't we we haven't done that typical LinkedIn, um, you know, Indeed or whatever type post. I, it's just when you meet someone, you kind of know right mm-hmm. away. You're like either you're either I like you or you're kind of a jerk. You're I, in I or think you're out. yeah, yeah. You you yeah. have a really good feeling real yeah. quick, and and you know maybe you know you figure out a little bit after, you know, as you as you meet people. But I think you know generally. I think I'm a good judge of character. You kind of like ran into him. You're like, I like you. Let's do it. Let's figure yeah. it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, I'll, I'll second that thought process. That that culture and character kind of kind of lead the day. I mean, I, I don't believe that what we're doing is rocket science. Mm-hmm. And, and so, like, there's a a culture and character uh, thing to it. And and specifically, as a company grows, you have to be more concerned about that mm-hmm. culture and that character because now you've got an apple cart, mm-hmm. right? And, and at the onset, when it's you and Steve, you know. 
you guys can deal with a lot. So mm-hmm. it's like it is what it is, and, and, and we can take some chances here, maybe mm-hmm. take a risk. But once you start to have an apple cart, now you're worried about being upset. And so mm-hmm. and so there's a, there's a, I don't know, almost like a mama bear protective thing that goes into place where it's like, all right, now I've mm-hmm. got my people. I've got my, my core yeah. group of, of, of folks that I, you know, support, I care about, mm-hmm. I want to make sure that they succeed. So now the next person in, Right. Like yeah. now you, you got to stand in front of the family and make sure that yeah. you're that you're worth it. You know? yeah. 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 And I mean, that's how we in, in we've had a couple interviews with people over the last couple of weeks as we're sort of figuring out that next step. And, and the way it usually works is, you know, we'll invite them to the office and we show them we're like, here's everyone. Go for it. You know, it's like a fire. It's not a firing squad, but, you know, everyone's there and everyone's kind of chatting and trying to feel out this person. And then usually Steve and I will go sit in the conference room or something and chat with them more more formally, I guess. Yeah. But, it's never like, hey, everyone, you know, this new person's showing up on Monday. You don't know anything about them. Um, like I said, Madeline and Chase went to the job fairs. We come back or they come back, and we're all looking at their resumes. We're all looking at their portfolios online. It's not it's not Steve and I building this by any means. It's it's this team that's building. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. I, I don't know. I can't. I love my team. I don't know. I, it's, I, it's, it's amazing to watch us build what this is. It's, it's just fun, and, and they're yeah. involved. So they're invested in that person, and they care just about, you know, just, just about as much as we do as, as, you know, if they fit or not, I guess. Right. When does well, it, yeah, go ahead. When does it click for you when you know you want to hire somebody? Because Nick is real apprehensive mm-hmm. up until he makes the offer. Like mm-hmm. that weird last 5%, he's like, uh, and he looks for reasons. Yeah. Or, <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, that is that is so true. I mean, hiring Madeline for the first was one of the biggest, scariest things because I, I don't know. I mean, you, Steve and I are very conservative. We've, we, we, you know, work hard and we put, we save our money. We don't really, we don't, you know, a lot of owners could take, pull all kinds of money. Oh, we're a young firm. We don't want to do that because it jeopardizes, I think, the future. But we're very conservative with just about everything with hiring. We want to make sure that if we commit, we're committed. Um, we fortunately have never had to lay anyone off or fire anyone, but that feels like that would be just about the worst thing to have to go through. It I is. suppose you, you. Yeah, it's 100% the worst. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, I don't want to do that. If, you know, right now we're trying to figure out, um, you know, we've got some potential project opportunities. It's like, if one, you know, a project or two hits, it's like, we feel like we're in a spot. I've been mm-hmm. telling Steve and everyone else, it feels like if these hit, we need help and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to figure it out. And, and we've yeah. got some great leads that we've kind of told them, like, just, just let us. We're not going to jump ship now, and we're not going to bring you on board and have you sit here and, and lay off in three months. That's the right. last thing anyone wants. I think that does, you know, a disservice to the culture and all that stuff too. It's just, it's, it doesn't feel responsible to do that. Well, and and when you're building, uh, you know, I think you guys are kind of going through the same thing that that we are, or I don't want to say we're. I feel I feel like we're still going through it. But when you're building, like the last thing you ever want to do is have a disruption, mm-hmm. and and so. You know, when you're saying make a commitment to somebody, that that commitment is we're not just hiring for a project load. We're not just hiring for a short term burst of of additional work that's come in. We're we're hiring for the long term, and the intent is that the short term burst of work that we may need you for today is a path of sustainability for the future. And so I think there's a, you know, the firm is naturally going to grow, right? That you know, as long as you guys are doing the things that you continue to do, the firm is naturally going to grow. So you're going to need people, and it's a function of when you need people and that that's complicated. I think there's a lot of people that don't understand that. There's a lot of people that are, are going to look at that and be like, well, all right, why are you stretching your team right now? It's like, well, we're, we're, we're putting the team in some stretch roles because we're not a hundred percent sure that the next six, eight, 12 months is, is sustainable at this pace. Mm-hmm. You know, we, you know, but if a few things hit, then it is. Right, yeah. And, and it, and it really is that way. And so to think like you got a couple of people at bay, is complicated but that's just life and 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 to have a you know one of the things that we've been we had been struggling with and have kind of worked to solve that problem over the last handful of months if not a year is where's the stream coming from right it's not like there's just like this this store that you can go to and buy employees right so so how are you sourcing how are you advertising how are you like like working to source employees and one of the things that we found is really really hitting the um the collegiate job fair is a little bit harder to understand, you know, spend some dollars investing is not inexpensive um, to, to figure out wh- where's that stream coming from. And we've opened up an internship program that, that's been really beneficial for creating a stream of, of, of new um, employees within Venn. So, so beyond that, what are you guys doing to kind of 
open up that stream of, of available employees? It really is the the job fairs. We've gone to, I mean, really, it's just been the ASU uh, design school job fair and then the U of A design school job fair. And then everything else has just been purely referrals. Like we, we have a job, um, I think a careers link on our website and I get, it, it comes in waves just depending on, I think the semester at school, what's happening. But there's some weeks where I get two or three things in a day and, and some are not worth the time to read the email. Right. But some are really good. And you're like, geez, I wish... I wish we could hire, you know, three people today because you just look amazing. And, um, but, uh, yeah, through that kind of trickle through the website, through the job fairs, and then just purely through word of mouth is, is really it. We don't we, – we, before we hired Christy, we felt – I felt really in a pinch, like we need someone now. Like it was like yeah. – it feels like the workload is long and strong and, and we need someone now. And, and I was down, trying everything I think. to get the friction on. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> and it was like I was slinging money everywhere. I was like, I'm going to use the Indeed. I'm going to use LinkedIn. And yeah. I, I, I was tracking it because I was curious. I was like, what does it cost to run these? And I think we spent fifteen or $1,800, or $1, which, you know, for a small firm is, is no chump change. It's, right. It, and we didn't get anything worthwhile out of it, I'd say. Well, and if anything, probably a total time suck of oh, yeah. reviewing like 200 oh, yeah. resumes that Just are a like, flood. like, these don't even... These don't even compute. Yeah, or yeah. or um, or they're across the country, you know, and things like that. And, and you know, as a small firm, it's hard to, I guess, recruit or pull someone. Mm. We don't have the, I don't know, we don't pay for moving expenses. We've never come across that hurdle, I guess. But I mean, that's there's different logistical challenges. Right. When you have someone across the country or an international um, person looking for a job, you know, you got all the lawyers fees and visas and stuff and, and we haven't gone through that but yeah. you know it's it's above and beyond what finding someone local is i guess what you guys yeah. doing are, are doing now at asu and u of a is going to be invaluable mm-hmm. to you 10 years from mm-hmm. now because if you guys spend that 1500 1800 dollars oh, yeah. at asu at u of a just being there mm-hmm. and and getting a two times a year mm-hmm. you meet with a hundred kids at a oh, career yeah. fair or something and they see your name then they're going to go out into the field. I think it's like something crazy, like 60% of ASU grads stay in Arizona. Oh, wow. I didn't so know that. At least in the construction field. Yeah. And, I mean, they're going to know you. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So maybe, maybe the time right after school isn't that time, but maybe they get to a, a senior level mm-hmm. project manager, whatever, and they're looking to make a move. Hey, I saw these guys back in, in college. Yeah. A little it's, bit of brand recognition. Invaluable. Invaluable. I mean, a little yeah. bit. It, what, what Exposure. What we've seen is... Um, it, you know, I did the same thing out of college, I guess. But but what we've seen is we've seen uh, kids come out of school. They want to chase the bigger names. Mm-hmm. They, oh, yeah. they, they want to be like, I, I want to work for the biggest contractor yeah. in town. I want to work for the most recognized architect. Mm-hmm. I want to work for an architect that's that's worldwide. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I worldwide, wide, wide. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to work for this huge firm. Yeah. And um, what we've seen is after three, four, five years of rolling around in that, you know, tumbling bucket then then we've seen you know folks be like hey i, I remember your name from doing this I, I remember seeing you guys from doing that i i think that what you're doing makes sense i think that what you're doing is is maybe a little more my speed i want to raise a family i want to have time to settle down i don't want to be traveling all over the yeah. all over the nation for this wastewater treatment plant yeah. build you know and it's like i I think that there's advantages to a smaller company that are maybe not sexy to somebody coming right out of school but become much more attractive to adults that, that are like, Hey, like I want to raise a family. I want to like, I want to settle down. I want to have a piece of something. I want to understand, like, like I want to be an impactful member of this team. And so I think initially it's like, you look at the teams, you're like, Oh, well, they have, you know, a hundred architects. Well, they have three architects. It's like, all right, well, but that's actually really attractive because you're a meaningful part of the team. Like what the, the decisions and the, and the work that you're going to do is going to have an immediate impact. Yeah. And so it, sometimes it takes a minute to make that explanation and i've sat in in plenty of interviews where you know we had a candidate come across it's like really strong and we're excited and we're sitting there and then and then all of a sudden it's like well how many states are you guys in one (laughs) why uh because that's what we're focused on right and and and, yeah yeah and that's our that's our focus Mm -hmm. right We're, we're not we're not here to try to build for you in 50 states i want to build for you here these are the people we know. These are the subs we know. These are the these are the um, you know the market that we know. We're gonna succeed in the market that we know. We're not gonna focus on the market that we don't. And and so we could do a really bad job in fifty states, or we could do a really great job in one. And that's our intent. And so the, it's it's absolutely by design. And so I think the same is probably true with you guys, where it's like maybe a little 
a little easier for architecture to 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 span you know local markets and things of that nature. But I think the mentality is the same, where it's like, hey, look, we we want to focus on this team. We want to know this team's capabilities because, similar to you and Steve, all of the relationships are are earned. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a relationship that I've cultivated over years and I'm going to hand that off to somebody else in my firm. Mm -hmm. And and that needs to be worth it. Yeah. It needs to be somebody I I trust you with this person. Yeah. Right? And yeah. and that's a lot. Oh yeah. And I think a lot of a lot of companies fail at that moment where they're like, "Hey, great. I landed this contract." And yeah. like send it off to somebody else, sound effects included. And so it's like, "How how is that customer service?" Yeah, I, I think it's uh, kind of on the on the flip side too. I mean, yes, yeah, that's totally totally like like everything we go through on on the content side, architecture side in general. Like, you know, I think what we are trying to do is to not only use the relationship Steve and I have, but let people develop their own. We we are a very open company. People, we are six people right now. A difference of one or two people swings that company, uh, you know, tremendously. If you add one or two people to a firm of a hundred. Mm -hmm doesn't change it at all. Um, so these these people we have, um, you know, really, it's kind of like, what do you want to do? And then that sort of swings the firm. We've asked people, right. what, what kind of, what do you want to focus on? And they're like, healthcare, or I really kind of like this industrial stuff a little bit that we're doing, or, or, you know, some of the people we've interviewed have talked about, you know, multifamily. It's like, great, you know, Steve and I don't necessarily have the multifamily portfolio or relationships, but it's like, if that's what you want, let's figure out as a team how to do that and right. grow a relationship, because that's what it is. It's growing a relationship. And I think, um, you know, I think, you know, the smaller firms just give you that opportunity. I think right. when you work at a big firm, you're being pushed a project. And and I think one of the scariest things that I think we've gotten a little bit more comfortable with is being comfortable passing off. I think that's one of the hardest hurdles when it was just Steve and I, you can work without even yep. talking, really. You just know yep. what each other's thinking. But getting that trust to say, okay, here's my baby is such a huge um, scary thing to, to pass off. And I think firms, smaller firms, sole proprietors who might have a contract worker or maybe one or two people, um, I think a lot of the times it's it's very guarded. It's, this is my baby. You do drawings. Don't ask me anything else. You're not going to know yeah. my consultants. You're not going to know mm -hmm. my clients. I'm not letting you talk to them. Um, and I've worked for firms like that, and I hate it. I, I, I hate it. You know, I, I we went to school. We are professionals. You know, I think to be an architect, you need at least five years, typically six, seven, eight years sometimes of school. It's like we went to school to be professionals. Let us do what we were trained to do. We're, yeah. Most of the time, we're smart people. You know, well, we'll figure things out. I think just trust us is, yeah. is really what it is. Do you think that that trust that you're putting in your employees is is one of your uh, unique selling properties? Oh, yeah. Like why, why you guys are growing the way you're growing is mm -hmm. because you're, you're giving that that power mm -hmm. and, and the freedom to mm -hmm. your employees? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I mean, you know, like I mentioned, we're a small firm. You know, the, the larger firms have their benefits and stuff that, that they offer that a small firm just can't. Um, but what we do offer is that trust and that possibility to grow. And I think you get the right people who are given that trust and they respect that trust and they honor that, I guess, and, and just work their butts off to, mm -hmm. to do the right thing. I think um, transforms the firm. I think you put that trust in the wrong person or someone who's maybe not quite experienced or maybe is too far above where they're at. Um, you know, you risk failure, and I think that, that hurts, you know, the firm overall. But I think some people will take that trust and run with it. Some will take that trust and abuse it. And I think it's finding that right, that right person or uh, right project for them at that right time, I think. Um, you know, I think it just helps them grow, I think, yeah. basically. Is, is it. I mean, we all make that mistake, yeah. though, right? We, we, which is why it, it becomes a little more complicated the next time. Yeah. And and, and so, you know, I think there's a it, – it's a necessity to grow. Like, yeah. like there's no way that your company is going to grow unless you – unless you start to exhibit some of that trust mm -hmm. with your employees and make those passes mm -hmm. and, and do some of the things that you need to do to allow the company to grow. So there's a there's a learning curve that takes place within yourself mm -hmm. as a business owner where it's – complicated yeah and and Incredible. how do you you know how do you pass off that relationship that you cultivated and and is is that employee going to understand the blood sweat and tears that went into making that client or how important they are how important they are you know, the, you know myself but the firm you know, right because you have big name clients it's like this is a lot of trust in you and yeah it's, it's sort of don't drop the ball yeah. right and, yeah and and so the yeah the amount of a trust that you exhibited earning then are you able to pass that that 
client off. And so I had that challenge myself when, when we were getting started. And, and one of the things that, that one of my mentors had, had told me was, well, then you're not doing a good enough job training your people. And I took like a super deep breath and I was like, well, that's not right. And the more that I thought about it, it's like, okay, like, Spend more time training your people. Spend more time working with them. Spend more time cultivating that true. What What are you holding back from? And I think there's always a level of competition in our industry, yeah. and so there's a there's a level of. I'm just not going to tell you every secret because there's a couple that I need to make sure that I can beat you, yeah. Yeah. and and so that like getting rid of that, getting rid of that veil, getting rid of that that curtain of of hiding a handful of things that you use to succeed. Yeah. I think was really the difference within Venn when we started to see our younger employees flourish mm -hmm. was when we kind of pulled the veil back and we were just like, all right, here's how this works. Like, this is how this goes. This is not necessarily rocket science, but there's an art to it. And so let, let's figure out how, how do we, how do we sell this appropriately? How do we teach our clients that we're really looking out for their best interests and that our prices may be a little bit higher because we've got you covered or, or there's these handful of things that we're trying to work through, or you know what, let's roll our sleeves up, get down and dirty. This is what the number is. And, yeah. and, and there's a handful of things that we do every day that I think are potentially uncomfortable, but mm -hmm. our, our younger, specifically our younger staff has been empowered and emboldened with recently because of just the pulling back of mm -hmm. the veil and just letting them get out there and figure it out. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, uh, can be kind of a self confidence thing. It's almost I, I can't give you my secret sauce because then it's out there. But right. I don't. I, I kind of. I just don't think. I think we kind of have our secret sauce at Cotton, but it's not something Steve or I or any of us really guard. It's it's our secret sauce is our responsiveness and stuff. That's not stuff that is proprietary to Cotton. We've got processes and standards and templates and stuff that is kind of proprietary to Cotton, but. You can't function as a business without sharing right. that. Mm -hmm. And I think um, you have to allow, I don't know if it's allowing, it's not allowing, I, I think people are worried that that employee might take that and go to a competitor or something like that. And it's like, of those things, I don't want to compete on that. I don't want to compete on having the best template. I don't want to compete on, I'd rather compete on other aspects of the business. Um, I'm, I'm always kind of a cooperation guy. Just a week or two ago, I called what would probably be one of our closest competitors. I've talked to you once or twice in my life. I know your name. I know you're known. And I was like, I just I had an issue. Just as a professional courtesy, I'm going to bounce this idea. This came up in the field. What do you think? And it was just a perfectly professional conversation. It's like, that's yeah. how I am. I, I'm not cutthroat. I'm not going to go stab you in the back. I'm not going to do all this stuff. It's about the relationships. We all just want projects to be built, I think, at the end of the day. And it's I'm going to compete on the things um, that differentiate me. I'm not going to compete on, like, I don't know, some of that behind-the-scenes stuff. I mean, my experience is that's kind of how our Phoenix market is. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I grew up in a small town, mm -hmm. and, and I had this this mentality that when I moved to the big city, like, everybody was going to have a knife and try to cut my throat every day. And I what I have found in this market is that if you're willing to be open and honest that the that for the most part, the market is is willing to accept you as that. And you're not going to win every time, but you're going to be given a level playing field in which to compete. And I, and I think that's all that we're asking for. Um, we're not we're not bidding work to win every project. We don't expect to win every project. And, and sometimes we're not even the right partner. And, and there's been a handful of, of conversations that we've had with clients where we're not the right partner. And it's like, hey, we may not, we may not be the right partner on this project for you, but you know, it doesn't mean that we're unwilling or, or um, unable to help. And I, and I think that that, like a professional courtesy call, uh, you know, it's a small world. We know our competition and we know our competition really well to the point that we call them, you know, it's not weird for us to give each other a high five and a hug at a job walk when we're, you know, it's just that's what the market is. I would prefer it that way as opposed to some sort of like closed fist, hide behind fences and chuck bombs over the wall, you know, kind of market. So, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I think teaching that to employees is also something that becomes maybe a little bit uncomfortable mm -hmm. because I think their initial reaction is like, wait, we hate those guys. Yeah. Those are yeah. Like, nah. Us versus them. And yeah, it's, yeah. It's just not that way. Like no. we're, you know, we're all trying to make a living. We're all trying to like, if projects don't go, we have nothing to do. Yeah. And so everybody is, is working towards the achievement and the success of a project being yeah. built. Right. Yeah. 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 And it's such a small, I mean, what is Phoenix? A couple million people or something like mm -hmm. that. I mean, I think there's probably, couple thousand architects in the valley there's I mean, we're the a couple hundred city in in america I yeah think. five six now? seven million i don't, I don't know. know it's us in houston six. it was always like phoenix and houston were always like bam bam and i always think of houston as this huge metropolis so i i don't know so is phoenix 
huge metropolis. Huge metropolis. Just billions of people. Yeah, I don't know. Billions. But it's such a small, small <laughs> world. Like healthcare architecture is, you know, a niche on a niche on a niche. And it's like, you know, we're all bumping into each other, I think. Yeah. Whenever the last, you know, I think merry-go-round of people in the valley, I mean, you hear all these people that are just, you know, you just kind of circulate around. Everyone's been at, mm -hmm. you know, some of the same firms, you know. It, it just is how it is. It's the smallest well, big world. People don't leave the market. So, no. so they may leave a firm, they may leave a company, they may do whatever, but they don't leave the market. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in 2008, um, you know, I was working with a larger firm and, and everybody got laid off. The mm -hmm. firm literally shut down. Mm -hmm. And very few people left the market. Mm -hmm. and, and I probably, those contacts have been my main contacts for the source of my entire career to mm -hmm. the point that I was on a job walk this morning and, and, you know, saw, you know, a competitor, but a guy that I worked with, you know, 15, yeah. 20 years ago. And it's like, hey, man, how are you? How yeah. are the kids? How's the wife? You know, and it's like, and so, but people traditionally haven't left our market. Mm -hmm. And so when, when things don't go well, when people, you know, are either fail or forced to fail mm -hmm. uh, because of a company not existing anymore, it's not a market that people leave. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a camaraderie, I think in this, in this market and yeah. yeah, people will change shirts, they'll change hats, they'll do whatever. But for the most part, they're not burning bridges mm -hmm. and they're also still here. Yeah. And so I think the, it's one of the number one lessons that I teach specifically younger folks is don't burn that bridge. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's unbelievable how often, you know, you may have a disagreement with somebody, so work it out. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable how often that these relationships come back around and mm -hmm. or you're successful simply because of your ability to ask a question. Mm -hmm. And and there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of answers. I don't know. I, I will tell clients all the time, like, you're going to ask me 10 questions. I'm going to know the answer to two or three. Yeah. But the other seven... I know the people I'll call find the answer. Or, I, I yeah. will get you the yep. answer. You know, and it doesn't mean that I have to bat at this high rate of, no. of knowing the answers, but I have to be responsive in getting the answers back. So we can be your 100% solution, but we're going to need help from our friends yeah. every single time. Oh, yeah. And I think that's kind of been the, the, the advantage and why we work so closely with you and Steve mm -hmm. and some of the other, you know, groups in town, mm -hmm. because we're able to pick up the phone and be like, hey. I got an issue yeah. here. How many sinks do I need in this area to make sure that I meet my store quarter yeah. requirements? You know, and we can we can ask these these questions and, and mm -hmm. get through these situations. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think um, I mean just along those lines, like kind of returning the favor. Like I worked with Kevin Candelaria so much on on so many of the projects that we've done with you guys. Like Kevin probably gets sick of me calling him or texting him. Like, hey, Kevin, not you guys aren't on this project, unfortunately. You know, but what do you what do you think on this or? Here's a little quick detail. What do you what do you think? Or even if issues came up on the job, just calling you guys or having them, you know, call us. It's just it's a relationship. It's just we just want to get stuff built. I right. think at the end of the day. Yeah. Make There's it look some easy. Sort of weird and, like hold no. back because we're not working on the job, so no. we're not gonna help you. That's, that's not how it works. No. Right. no. So building off that collaboration with people outside the industry, mm -hmm. uh, in in I guess secondary markets, whatever, Phoenix did this thing where now they're removing um, the initial inspection from drawings for surgery centers, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. So it's it's all up to the you architectural guys. review. Yeah. The architectural no longer review. Yeah, it does no longer exist. So what is Cotton doing uh, in that process to make sure that when they review it once it's built, they don't go, this is all wrong, and mm -hmm. then you got to tear down and start over? What, what are you guys doing internally to... to the, there's multiple stopgap measures along the way. You know, I'm... Uh, it particular, particularly on ASC projects or imaging, I am I am in those. I am in those projects every day. Those are those are my babies. That's what I really really love to do. Um, so there's multiple you know phase check ins. You're meeting with clients and stuff early on to make sure that you're pulling in their feedback as much as possible, so they get what they want. I guess first of all, you get the get the client and the users what they want. Um, in terms of kind of the more specific code requirements, um, like I said, after every phase, we're reviewing the drawings. We're pausing. Uh, sometimes as a design team, it's like we're pausing for an entire week, give, you know, especially myself, give me a week to kind of digest, review, put comments together. We'll fire it back off. You guys do the same thing. We use Bluebeam, so it's all live. Everyone's putting comments in together. Um, so we do that all along the way. So, you know, through that process, we're giving our best, you know, design we can that meets all of these different requirements. Um, once you get into construction, there's always little issues and stuff that arise. So we're documenting along the way, um, you know, documenting RFI solutions, all that kind of stuff. Changes to the drawings because really the state cares about what the final built product right. is. Um, and then, yeah, like you were alluding to, the, the states changed their process, I think, November of 2020, I believe, yeah. or 2022, maybe. I can't remember the specific date. But, yeah, they're, they're typically... September last year. Is that... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But you, you typically have had to um, compile a whole bunch of information, submit it to the state. They'll kind of architecturally review the drawings. Um, usually you go through one or two cycles of review, then the state kicks it over to the licensing side. But there's a whole package of information that goes to, um, to the state or used to go to the state, and we would have to review that before we go in. We have to sign a form that says, to the best of our knowledge, we believe this meets your requirements. Um, so even at that point, it's, okay, we're reviewing the drawings. Mm -hmm. Is there an issue? If there is an issue, it's got to be fixed. Um, but is there an issue? So there's all these, like, check checkpoints, I guess. But there used to be more. Like, like yeah. there used to be the, I don't want to say the blanket, but the blanket of an architectural mm -hmm. review. And that no longer exists. No. So now what you're doing is you're providing an attestation. Yeah. And you're basically saying, we designed this to meet yeah. the These requirements. But the, the attestation has... has <laughs> Sign it in blood. That's pretty much it. Though it, the attestation hasn't changed. We had to do that as part of the mm -hmm. old um, that old package. But what that now says is, we still compiled all that information that we used to have to. You can sign that form without having to do that. That's that's kind of your risk. That's that's a big kind of risk that that architect takes on. But that that form, I, I don't take it lightly. You sign that. And it says I still reviewed the testing and balance. I still did all this stuff. That's what that form says. It's not I you know looks good to me, you know, kind of a substantial completion form or, or you know, a punch list. It's, it's, it's pretty intensive what, what is technically required of that. Mm -hmm. I think there might be some fly-by-night firms. I don't know of any. I'm not thinking of anyone in particular, but that might just sign that, you know, hey, done with the project. Yep, get in the state, get it licensed. And the owner's like, great, you know, you got me licensed in two weeks now instead of 90 days. Mm -hmm. But I, I, don't, I, don't, I take that pretty seriously. It's, you know, that's my name. That's my stamp on that form. I have to put my stamp on there. Um, so I'm still reviewing all that stuff. I'm still reviewing the, you know, fire alarm, sprinkler drawing, all that stuff that, that's part yeah, of it. Yeah, I think the, the risk and, and the, the challenge is there's always interpretation. Mm -hmm. So there, there's interpretation to the code. There's an inter interpretation to the requirements. If we're trying to work within an existing space, mm -hmm. a lot of times we may be making an interpretation together that mm -hmm. that's – I'll say gray. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, you know, it, we interpret something one way. ADHS may interpret something oh, yeah. another way. And so the the blanket that's removed is the architectural review mm -hmm. that although it was never a swift process, mm -hmm. at least you had that coverage of, okay, so they agree with the way that mm -hmm. we interpreted this. And you're not really rolling the dice on the final inspection. Yeah. Because at the inspection, we're built. Yeah. So shifting a wall, moving a corridor around, doing these things, Huge. like this is major, big... you know, surgery, pun intended, mm -hmm. at, at that point where it's like, normally you had the architectural review to mm -hmm. kind of cover you. I mean, way back when we had the 50% inspection, mm -hmm. we'd be able to walk through, you know, at rough in yeah. and walk the inspector through at that point, which honestly, I really missed being able to do that. But yeah. um, it just feels like there's more risk being asked of the architect at this point. Absolutely. And, and, and owners too i mean they they kind of have to buy into that um yeah like you you kind of said i didn't didn't mention that but yeah the old process was they had much more in-person quality control i guess from the state i mean they pick up the phone they don't pick up the phone anymore no no i i think there's i i don't know but i think they're short-staffed and, and they just don't have the staff to be able to do that they don't have the staff to to do the inspections i think i think you know the last that's recession what led probably to killed this. that I mean, yeah I think that's what led to this yeah and it so it's just two people I There's think. like two people in Phoenix doing it. I yeah. mean, I think it's down to one now. Even back in the day, there was always really only two yeah. individuals that, that handled the ADHS as far as interface is concerned mm -hmm. with designers and contractors. But Bananas. It, kind of. Um, and then the, when you think about the influx of, of surgery center construction, mm -hmm. you think about the influx of healthcare construction over the valley over the last five years, kind of a bananas concept. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, shifting the risk I'll say shifting the risk. Mm -hmm. I think that's appropriate to really the designer architects mm -hmm. has been probably a necessary thing. Mm -hmm. But at the same point, you kind of got everything banked in on that, on that final inspection. And yeah. that, you know, we haven't had any challenges with it, but at the same point, yeah. I think the, it just feels different. It hits different. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, kind of along those lines, I think, I think that, I don't want to say that risk scares people. I think, for me, it's like, I'm going to own up to it. Okay, that's the world we live in. Like, yep. with that risk comes a little extra, you know, I, you're going to get reviewed hard. You know, I think that pushes it back. I think I think in some ways it is it is what the architect or design team needs to do to begin with. I think it's it's too easy when someone's like, oh, I get this other third party looking over things. Like, I'll just kind of let this slide, right. see, what, see what sort of goes. I think I think you kind of have to own up to that. It's, it's your responsibility is the way I look at it. But um, kind of going back to the state, I, I think... I've worked with a lot of city and state 
agencies and, and to AZDHS's credit, I mean, they've, they've been very collaborative on some of the surgery center we've done with you guys in existing buildings. Early on, one of the things we did was just reach out to them and set up a meeting and we would sit with Lois and the other, you know, big hitters over at, at DHS and, and just go, here's the building. Here's kind of our deficiency matrix that I observed and walked through and documented on my floor mm-hmm. plan. What, what do you see? Do you see any other huge red flags? Here's a condition that I know is existing non-conforming or non-compliant, whatever you want to call it. What are you going to make us do? Like, you know, ideally. How do we owner, fix it? Yeah, the owner doesn't want to move med gas outlets in this case. And and what are you going to make us do? You're going to make us move it? Okay, well, we'll at least design that in now, not, you know, when you come out and walk it and, oh, shoot, you know, we've got med gas, which is incredibly expensive. To right, move. right. Um, so, yeah, they give you great feedback, and they're not going to catch everything in those hour-long meetings, but you build a rapport with them, um, which is the main thing, like I said, relationships and rapport. Right. Collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Collaboration. Synergy. So <laughs> we got to wrap this up. Uh, last question. What's the future of cotton? Where, where are you guys headed? Where do you, where do you want to be? I don't know. We, uh, we um, when we started, Steve and I were kind of – we always kind of ask people at the firm and, and each other, like, well, what, do you, what, what are we doing? What, how big are we getting? Neither of us, you know, all those big firm things we just talked about, we don't want that. I think at, when we started, it was like, well, five to seven people, and we're there. You know, it's like, oh, well, shoot, okay, well, you know, we could be seven or eight here in the next couple of months. The, the key point on the growth size is I don't want to change the culture. I love right. the, the culture. So I don't know. We haven't crossed that line yet. I don't know if it's going to be the eighth. I don't know if it's the 15th. But um I don't want to lose that. I don't want to work for a big firm. I want to keep keep working with people I enjoy. I never want to get to a point where I'm not involved in projects. I love being an architect mm-hmm. beginning to end. I don't want to be just a principal and do billing all day, which is what I've had to do the last two days, which is really, really fun. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I never want to be Billing is not that. as much fun as paying. Uh, I, so, I, the, yeah, you know, there yeah. is still a difference, but yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, I never want to get to that point where I'm removed from that stuff. I love working with clients. I love um, – getting them to build their suites. So, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I think we're going to keep growing and keep keep exploring different opportunities. And I think it's really client-driven and, and staff-driven. I think Steve and I both like what we do. And I think it's like I mentioned, you know, hey, you want to try a slightly different market sector? Let's, you know, put our toe in there and try mm-hmm. it out and see and, and see what see what happens. But it's it's kind of let that organic nature grow. It's not we got to be 15 people in five years and right. if we don't hit that, we're a failure. It's, it's been organic since, you know, ever since the beginning. So it's kind of let that keep running its course, I guess, and, and see it's, it's continuing to push the healthcare side. I think, you know, we're definitely known on the healthcare side for kind of our technical focus. Our, we've done a lot of healthcare TIs. We're doing a fair amount of kind of ground up medical type stuff now. So I think it's continuing to push that, continuing to grow that, continuing to push the surgery center type stuff. Um, but to kind of grow from that technical side too, we want to be known as a design firm. I think we're growing our design capabilities mm-hmm. so quick in house, so it's continuing to push that. So we mm-hmm. can kind of be known for that as well. On top of the relationships, on top of the technical side, it's it's kind of growing that as kind of the, the next step healthcare wise. And then, like I said, explore some other market sectors that seem fun. It's good. Like what? Water parks. Let's do it. Roller coasters. Yeah. <laughs> Roller coasters. Yeah. Anything. Love yeah. it. Shooting yeah. ranges, whatever. Yeah. Shooting ranges. Yeah. Hey, you do that. that goes back, yeah. Yeah. Ice rinks? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That awesome. Great. Hotel. One. I don't know. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Appreciate Thanks, you. Cool. Thanks, Appreciate guys. Good. Is that where you do the, the flames? You do the flames, yeah. It's one flame video. <laughs> In all of it. Just some graphic on the screen. <laughs> yeah. That's God.